I would like to remind you once again that we are moving towards this island of stability, which is based on a theoretical prediction. We have come a long way since the year 1940, when the first elements after uranium were obtained. First, Eight elements were obtained in the reactor, then six elements on charged light particles, then there was cold fusion, where lead was used as a target, and another six elements were obtained as a result. This is our goal. So far, we have concluded that we can get there, if we increase the complexity of the experiment by taking an exotic target made of artificial elements, by making use of isotopes with a large excess of neutrons, and by taking an exotic but stable isotope of calcium-48 as a bombarding ion. These are the three pillars that hold everything together. These are targets that are obtained in a reactor with a large neutron flux, these are the elements, their heaviest isotopes. One experiment requires 12 to 15 milligrams of calcium-48. Sometimes these 15 milligrams are obtained with great difficulty because it takes a whole year of operation of a powerful reactor at Oak Ridge to get it. In order to use calcium-48 ions, the accelerator setup was significantly redesigned. A beam of 1 microampere per particle was achieved, which means 6 times 10 to the power of minus 12 particles per second at a calcium consumption rate of 0.5 to 1 milligrams per hour. The efficiency of using neutral calcium is approximately 1%. From 1 gram, only 10 milligrams in an accelerator are brought to a speed of one-tenth the speed of light. And even at this speed, it is possible to study nuclear reactions, because the Coulomb barrier is overcome. Then we face a difficult obstacle. It is to isolate one event out of 10 to the power of 12 reaction byproducts that occur in the target. And this must be done quickly. We do not know in advance what lifetime these super-heavy nuclei will have. We are ignorant when it comes to this logarithmic scale. It can be seconds, tenths, hundreds, thousands of a second, and therefore the installation should be fast and selective in order to identify one SH nucleus out of 10 to the power of 12 other reaction products. This is achieved using the separator which was discussed last time, that operates on the principle of different charges for the incoming particle and the recoil nucleus, which results from the reaction. Even if they move together at an angle of zero degrees, they will enter a gas-filled chamber, and the gas in this case was hydrogen, where, in the beam, the fast particles quickly drop their electrons, become highly charged, and therefore have a small magnetic rigidity and can be deflected, indicated by this blue line here. While the slow-moving recoil nucleus loses little charge, has a large magnetic rigidity, and can be collected on the focal plane. And from here to here is a distance of 4 meters. The recoil nucleus moves through these 4 meters in 1 microsecond. We will now compare our results 
with those obtained in 1985. When the upper limits of the sensitivity level were obtained, we managed to improve the sensitivity of the experiment by about 1,000 times, by three orders of magnitude. And essentially we redid everything. At the same time, we invented a fast-acting separation process, allowing us to investigate nuclei, even if their lifetime is from 10 to the power of minus 6 seconds, up to one or several days. Both are extreme cases. In the case of a 10 to the power of minus 6 seconds lifetime, this is simply the distance between the target and the detector. In another case, it is important to ensure that during the one, two or three days, while the detector is operational, there would be no background noise from the moment when the recoil nucleus enters the detector to the moment when we see its decay. Otherwise, everything can get mixed up. We must identify how this nucleus behaves over several days, up to about three or four days. During this large interval, you can see what happens in these reactions.